In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. I'm going to share a bit this morning that uh, God has put in my heart um, regarding the end time church, what we should expect, what we should look for, what we should be a part of. Because there seems to be this, uh, particularly in the Western world, a great falling away from those who are part of Christian religion. And the remnant who say, no, we're men and women who know God and our task is to make him known. There's been a great severing. And so we want to be part of the remnant, those who are called of God and those who are going to be correctly positioned in these last days. Amen? Amen. Because it's on for young and old. And I think the next uh, few years are going to be the most interesting years of human history. Everything's all geared to go according to the prophetic word of God. If you know the scriptures, you know the prophetic word. You read the newspaper, you say, it's happening. It's happening in this time. It's happening. And uh, just start with Matthew 24 this morning, if you join me with looking at scripture. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Matthew 24. In verse 3, Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things shall be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. And Jesus said, Take heed that no one deceive you. So one of the first signs, of course, is going to be deception. Uh, Deception on a mass scale. And because you and I have the word of God, we are without excuse in terms of deception. Because we know that looking into the word is like a man looking into a mirror and seeing the exact representation. However, there are still many deceived, those who don't know the Lord, and there are those who know the Lord who have been self-deceived by having an opinion contrary to the word of God and defiling their life contrary to what God says. That's deception. But this book, is, is uh, James says, is like one who looks in a mirror and he sees exactly what's there. So Matthew 24 says, Take heed that you don't get deceived. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in different places. These are the beginning of sorrows. These are the beginning of sorrows. They shall deliver you to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now we know that um, AD 70, the Rome coming against uh, Jerusalem and the fall of Jerusalem, that that was historically true in that season. But the spiritual truth is talking of when Jesus returns and so we see this, this double meaning in this picture. And in that time, of course, we see many were delivered to be afflicted and killed and hated and so on. Uh, many will be offended, shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many <coughs> excuse me, false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So the end time church is a picture of those who, who, who have endured. Who have endured. Long suffering with joyfulness. That's the prayer we pray from Colossians. Colossians 1, 9 to 11. Now, most people opt for the joyful part, but they forget it's long-suffering with joyfulness. It's going through the persecution, the opposition, the misunderstanding, the conflict of an old nature trying to rise up, the new nature of Christ coming forth, being misunderstood by the world. These are very real issues. And what it can do is sow seeds of offence. Many will be offended. And if you have an offended heart, it says your love shall grow cold or wax cold. You, you were burning with fire. You were like, as it were, molten wax, red hot. But as you cool down, like wax cools down, you could become hard and cold and rigid and immovable, set in your opinion and your ways. That's a heart that waxes cold. We need to have that burning fire that causes us to be flexible and, and flowing with what God is saying and what God is doing. Amen. So we have a picture. There will be those who have endured to the end, those who are saved, uh, those who have not renounced the truth of the gospel. Um, but take heed how you build. Take heed how you build. From 1 Corinthians chapter 3, take heed. Be very careful. I said it last week, hinds feet on high places. Every step is important. <coughs> Excuse me, critical days. 
So I'm having a look at how the Lord builds. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord build the house. Repeat, say it with me. Unless the Lord build the house. If you know it, tell the person next to you. Unless the Lord build the house. They labour in vain that build it. Unless the Lord build the house. Unless Pastor Phil can find the scripture. Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. Connected to this other truth, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waiteth but in vain. So a lot of people say, well, I'm a watchman in the body, and of course many are. Those who've got that prophetic intercessory gift in, in a stronger measure than perhaps just that which we all have. Watching and waiting, looking, seeing. It says, but unless the Lord is in the work, unless the Lord is giving the blueprints, unless the Lord is giving the pattern, it's not going to work. It doesn't matter how spiritual you may be in the strength of your gifting, unless the Lord's in the midst of it all. That's why they praise and worship. It's really all about him. Well, everything's all about him, actually. But particularly when we come in and say, Lord, here's my offering. We are the living offerings ourselves, but nevertheless we... You don't come into the presence of a king without an offering. That's even in the natural. It's unheard of to have some kind of offering, whether it just be a greeting or some kind of national accolade the country you represent or specific gifts that you've brought in honour. That's just That just happens in the natural world. So to come to the Lord without anything is not appropriate. Praise God, he's merciful. He says, this bunch just want more of me, but I want more of them. And you and I are the offering this morning. Yes, we give of our substance, we give of that gift to him, we give of our personalities and do all that, those realities as well. But God is looking for the church that loves him with all of their heart. And number one, let me say, a church that's built according to the pattern Think of those two words, the pattern. Because as I was just praying and searching and researching some things for today, I felt the Lord remind me of the pattern that he's always built with a blueprint. He's not a haphazard God. It forms within his own heart and his mind and then through his words he creates, but it's all according to pattern. Yes? You could buy a block of land somewhere probably out of, out of suburbs, a bit cheaper. And you can have all the building materials sort of brought in. You can have truck after truck. They've brought the foundation stones. They've brought all the bricks and you know, all the things that are needed to build a house. And the trucks are sort of put it all there. It's all, all gathered in that place. Is it a house? No. It's just a whole lot of stuff that's gathered together. It's not built into a house. And when God brings patterns, he says, you, you, you as living stones don't just gather, you come and I assemble. The church actually is called an assembly in numbers of scriptures. The ecclesia, those who are brought out of the world called into the kingdom, are uh, called an assembly because God in the midst is building according to pattern. And much of that pattern is calling and anointing and gifting. It's also experience. It's very definitely the foundation of character. And so living stones can't just be built into a house or a habitation or a temple or a dwelling place for God. It looks an absolute mess. Everything's all just gathered together and dumped on the block. That ain't a house. And yet it's all gathered. So I can't help but feel in these days God is bringing order kingdom, divine order into the body of Christ in a measure we've never known before. Perhaps even to the degree that the things that God winked at before he no longer winks at and says, I'm emphasising these areas of truth that everyone's in position according to calling, according to anointing, according to gifting, according to experience, character. 
because if there's no pattern, according to the pictures of the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, where there was no pattern, there was no glory. Where there was no pattern, where it was absolutely all over the place, there was no presence of God in, in the glory that's necessary. And we need, we need a greater glory in this day. We need the fullness of the measure of the stature of the Lord himself to, to descend and heaven come down in power so we can capture entire cities and nations. And it can be done. You know what? It's going to be done. It will be done by inverted commas, a remnant of people who understand what church is and what Christian life is. That it's not just an individual pursuit. Now that I'm saved, I'll do what I want. Now that I have liberty and freedom, I can use it as an occasion for the flesh if I want to. I don't have to be responsible. I don't have to be committed. I don't have to undergird financially. I don't have to do these things. I'm free. Well, we're free to follow the pattern. We're set free from the bondage of the enemy to oppose the Lord and we're free now. Yes, Lord, as for me and my house, we're coming. We're following. That's what God's desire. He's always desired that. <laughs> but I, I get a sense there's a, there's a, a, a deeper desiring and, and God is saying, I'm going to get this. He's still a good, good father. He knows that we need the glory. So we build according to pattern. Just a, a few thoughts about that. Ta- the tabernacle of Moses, if you were to read, which we won't do now, Exodus chapters 39 and 40, I mean, you read through the incredible intricacy of detail for the building of, the, of that uh, um, tabernacle. Incredible. Two chapters of do this and do this and cover it with this and cover it with this and make it this size, use that material, do this, do this, do this. Two chapters giving the exact pattern that God required. Now, this is not because God's pedantic and he just wants it his way. He says, if you do it according to pattern, the meaning of it will be so real that my glory is going to dwell there because you build it for me and this is what I require. So, I was just looking at the end of Exodus 39, if you want to check it out. Exodus 39 and... um, Probably good material to have a quiet time on during the week. But verse 42 of Exodus 39, According to all that the Lord commanded uh, Moses, so the children of Israel made the work. Moses looked upon the work and beheld, uh, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. This is Exodus chapter 39, verse 42 and 43. That they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it. And Moses blessed them. So they did it according to the pattern and yet by the end of um, chapter 40, Exodus 40, verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of the congregation the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Why? Because they built it according to the pattern. Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Hallelujah. When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, fire was on it by night, in the sight of all of the house of Israel throughout all of their journey. Now the the glory cloud came and the fire of the glory came after they'd done everything according to pattern. The same principle with Solomon's temple in Second Chronicles chapter 5. This is a more familiar passage, I suppose, because of the, the glory that came and the priests couldn't stand. And I used to love that when I first came into the spirit. I used to read it and read it. I thought it was fabulous. And I read it now and it's still fabulous when the glory comes. So Second Chronicles chapter 5. If you've got scriptures with you, good to turn, have a look, or if it's is it appearing behind me there somehow? Is it, are they on to it? Second Chronicles chapter five and then in verse eleven, and again preceding this the pattern was given, the pattern was given, the pattern was given. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, and they did not then wait by cause. 
Also the Levites, which were the singers and all of those of Asaph and Heman and Jejuthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. When they lifted up their voice with the trumpet and the cymbals, the instruments of music, and they praised the Lord, saying, He is good, his mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. So we get this picture that if it's built according to pattern, the pattern will bring the glory. So the tabernacle of Moses, Solomon's temple, and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the perfect pattern, the perfect blueprint, So for the New Testament revelation of the pattern of God, we now see it in the person of Jesus who was in fact the tabernacle and the temple. Remember he said, you destroy this temple, it will be raised up again. So we find that the Lord Jesus Christ now becomes the measure, the standard, the pattern for all New Testament believers. Perfect in thought, perfect in word, perfect in deed. And one of the greatest desires of all of our hearts is Christ's likeness being just the the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Is that in your heart? I'm sure it is. That's the measure. The measure is not the performance of religion. It's not the sound of the band. It's not all of the peripheral issues, which still are important, but it's about the very core of the faith, which is the person. That we must conform to him, Galatians 4.19, I pray that Christ be formed in you. In fact, I travail again, meaning he's travailed once for people to be saved and now he's travailing again that Christ be formed in them. That's the pattern. People are copying church patterns saying, well, if we did it like they do it, we'll get a similar result. Well, you might do too, but it may not be the glory. It may be a certain look, a certain sound, a certain cultural relevancy. It could be all sorts of other things that will work at some level. But what we're aiming for now is the glory of the Lord whether we're in a building, whether we're in houses, whether we're under trees, whether we're wherever. That the glory of the Lord, Christ in me, that hope. All right, so that's the pattern. Um, Revelations 21, 22 gives a pattern of the eternal city of God. Two chapters given to the details about this four square city called the city of God, the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Incredible detail, incredible picture. It's a glorious hope to study that. We don't live in the era of the tabernacle of Moses. We don't live in the period of Solomon's temple. We do live in the period of the Lord Jesus Christ and that which is still to come, that eternal city of God. It ought to thrill us, it ought to excite us, it ought to to propel us forward. And that's Revelation 21, 22. won't read it all about this glorious picture of this four-square city of God that will be the very people of God themselves dwelling with the Lord. Hallelujah. We also get the picture of the New Testament church. The New Testament church. Ephesians 4 is is a good pattern. In fact, all of Ephesians is a pattern for the church. But Ephesians 4. Hallelujah. Every now and again, someone say, Hallelujah. It just means praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Ephesians chapter 4, we won't read through the whole chapter, but here we have a picture of a mature church starting in verse 13. Till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature or a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now that's God's standard, the stature of the measure of the fullness of Christ. There's no lesser standard that's acceptable to a perfect God, which is why you and I are found in Christ. Hallelujah, he doesn't measure us according to our past or even our present condition. He says, I see you in Christ. I see you as righteous, without sin and without a heart that's cold. I see you on fire. That's, he sees us in Christ. The word points out those areas of our soul that are still not whole and, not da- and are damaged that we need to work on. But when God looks at us, he looks at p- the perfection of Jesus Christ. And here's a picture of maturity, verse 14, Ephesians 4. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro 
carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There it is again, deception. Deception primarily is anything that is opposing the word of God. Anything that, that you have even as an opinion or a belief system that opposes the word of God equals deception. So there's much deception because Jesus said it would be like that towards the end. There'll be false Christs. They may actually call themselves Christ or of Christ, but they will be false Christs because they will not be centred on that person. They'll have all sorts of other doctrines. Do you know in, in the New Testament discipline, which is something that we don't talk about a lot, that it is very important to God that you and I be disciplined in the sense of made into disciples, not discipline as punishment, but discipline as in shape up girls and boys, that kind of discipline. Not pleasant, it says in Hebrew. It's not very pleasant, but it brings forth a lifetime of an eternal life of glory. But the two areas that, uh, that come under Christian discipline, the first area is doctrinal differences, doctrinal problems. That spirit behind what the Bible calls sectarianism. The word sect those who hold an opinion that's against God and therefore their opinion separates them from everybody else and we're an exclusive group. We don't agree with what others think. We have our own revelation. You're a sect. And various New Testament words come under that sectarian sin. The sin of there's, you know, emulation and I'll go into that and variance and these old words and sedition and all the things that cause division and strife. It even says if there's anyone bringing strife, number that one. So this might sound, oh my goodness, I didn't think Christianity was going to be like that. I thought it was all about love. Well, it is about love, but love that doesn't have any boundaries is simply lust. I do what I want to do. So we find that there is a standard and the New Testament standard according here is to grow up in the faith by having a standard of the measure of the stature of fullness. Then you won't be thrown around like children carrying on with all different doctrines and revelations that people are pushing forth in this hour, not based on scripture, or maybe it's a misunderstanding of scripture. It says by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, you can feel there are demons behind false doctrines. The other area of Christian discipline is human behaviours. One is doctrinal problems, the other is human behaviour problems. And that lists a number of areas that we have to address as we mature and grow, we can, we'll handle it. You know, we have the right as a brother's keeper to love one another and speak in truth, in love. So um, the New Testament church is going to be exactly that, the fullness of the stature of Christ and that'll be the church, Ephesians 5 says, is in the glory. No spot, no wrinkle, no blemish, no unresolved issues, everything now in line with the character of Jesus. Hallelujah. I mean, if Jesus is perfect and he's going to have his bride, the bride's going to have to be perfect. Now, in him we are, but we're resolving those issues that would try and hang around our soul life, reminding us of the past, trying to draw us back into those lusts and desires. Hallelujah. More than conquerors, praise God. More than conquerors. Without saying a word, person next to you. <laughs> More than conquerors. First Corinthians 3, 9 and 10 says, Therefore, take, take care how you build. Foundation is Christ, take care how you build. So here we have the end time church, the church that's built according to the pattern. What's the pattern? The New Testament revelation of who God is through Jesus Christ. It's the blueprint of the scriptures. It's an understanding that this, the scriptures have to be rightly divided. This is still a problem with religion. People cannot divide the two covenants. So they'll quote the old covenant which has already been fulfilled in the life of Christ and they'll be thrown around very negative, threatening type scriptures. But it's scriptural, it's scriptural. Yeah, but it's also been fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus. No longer eye for eye, tooth for tooth. No longer the death penalty because you've missed the mark. I mean, imagine the size of this congregation if there was the death penalty every time you missed the mark. I guarantee you this, there'll be no one out the front. You might all turn up, you perfect ones, but I, I'd lost the battle way back there. 
You know why? The scripture says, whatever's not of faith is sin. That's for the self-righteous and the pious who says, I have no sin. Well, whatever's not of faith is sin. Instead of judging the external, the seeing and the hearing and looking at people, judge not lest you be judged. So we find that this New Testament pattern, it's going to happen according to what God says. Secondly, what will the church look like? I believe it will be militant and victorious. Now already we, we would agree that we are victorious, but not everyone has victory after victory after victory. I'm looking for an unbroken, unbroken record of victory after victory after victory to a greater victory, greater victory, greater victory. I'm not looking for victory, victory, failure, victory, failure, victory, 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 failure. I'm not looking for that. I'm going up and on. We agree with that? We're learning from mistakes. We're learning through experience. We're learning through, you know, it's better to have this as preventative cure than remedial medicine. A lot of us have had to take the word of God as medicine because we didn't have the preventative cure. So get in first with scriptures and apply the scriptures and have your life in line with scriptures and then you won't need the remedy of the word. But praise God, the word is still medicine. Is everyone taking the medicine? I'm heavily medicated. <laughs> heavily medicated. Drunk with, drunk with the glory. That's going, to be, that's going to be seen in the body of Christ as it was seen on the day of Pentecost. There, there is, a, there is a, a, I know it's offensive to some people and I don't want to be, but there is a drunken glory which is a, which is a high, high expression of the glory. What does it mean? It means you're no longer in charge of everything you say and do. You're so yielded. I know some flesh it out, make it up and give it a bad name. But there is a depth of God's being filling you to overflowing that you, you, can, you, you, you can barely... Uh, what where was I? I can barely, I've had very few moments of that, but I'm desiring it. Not to be stupid or to look stupid, but to know that I'm so full of God, it's just oozing out of me. That's what I want. Yeah? A church that's victorious. Oh, glory. Matthew 16. Stay with me. It's only three or four points. Hallelujah. Matthew 16. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Peter, who do, who do men say that I am? Matthew chapter 16. Starts with that revelation of who Jesus is. Verse 13, Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? The, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, he said, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's say that really boldly today. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You and I are going to be using the keys of the kingdom of heaven more in these last days than ever before. And when it comes down to the bottom line, to loose means to allow, to bind means to disallow. It says whatever's bound in heaven, not allowed in heaven, not allowed to manifest, not allowed, not allowed to even be present in heaven, then you stop it from being around you. Get rid of that thing. Bind it up. Don't allow it. So this all comes again under discipline. In discipline, not personal discipline, but spiritual discipline. In Matthew 18, the same phrase is used about binding and loosing, but it's talking about the discipline of a person through behavioural issues. And primarily it says you can, you can bind that kind of behaviour. Don't allow it. Stop it. Address it. Find the root of it. I guarantee it's all of us in some area. He says, don't allow that. When you judge yourself, you, you stop the things that aren't right. By the grace and the truth that's in Jesus, John 1, 14, full of grace, full of truth, you know, we, we can self-discipline. It's the fruit of the Spirit.
So here, the keys of the kingdom. You are Peter upon this rock. This is not Jesus, uh, Peter being the first pope. This is the fact that I am the mighty rock. You are a little, little, little pebble. But upon the confession of this mighty rock that I'm the Christ, I'll build my church. We, we sort of know that. Some people are a bit confused about that. So the church that stands against the gates of hell, the church that storms the kingdom of darkness because legally we've been totally delivered from it. A church built on the rock, Christ. A church who has Christ as the head, the architect, the wise builder. That's who we are. This warfare is not natural. So we have, unfortunately, in the history of Christendom, we have a kind of warfare that was done in the, in the flesh, politically motivated e.g. the Crusades and numbers of other expressions which again confuse the world. But our warfare is spiritual. Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God and there's your war. Fair weapons. Go to war. You're already in hostile territory. If anyone says, where's the war? We live in hostile territory. Hallelujah. The war may not be within you anymore because you've got the peace of God but there'll be warring members maybe in family and the in-laws and the outlaws. There's certainly warring members in the suburbs and the cities and the nations. So we are in hostile territory, but however, the kingdoms of this world will soon become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever. You see nations falling under the power of God. It's called revival. Australia's going to be one of those nations, sheep nation that's blessed of the spirit of God. So we need to have a kind of attitude that says we are militant and we will be victorious. In every aspect of life, we will have the victory because God has given us the victory. Thirdly, you've got the church built according to the pattern, the church militant and victorious. Um, as I said, the church that has the keys of the kingdom, the church that knows how to loose and bind. Um, that same church is connected to heaven, earth joined to heaven, 1 Corinthians 6.17. Whoever's joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's why it's vital for us to remain in the spirit. Not just the spirit in us, but us in the spirit. So that every thought, word and deed is, is controlled by the spirit realm. I was reading in Genesis 14, it says um, Melchizedek was called, sorry, Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, you belong to the Most High God. His affirmation was, Abraham, you belong to God, you're connected even as the enemies of Israel realise God is with them, they're connected. And uh, more so for us as the New Testament church, we are one with the Lord. We have a level of union with God through Christ, no doubt about it. You only have to just get your mind right and all of a sudden you're tabernacled by the Spirit of God and you can look up, as it were, and see heaven. We have an open heaven. It's a resident open heaven. Church, we have a resident open heaven. You can just have access to the spiritual realities of revelation and whatever it is, power, glory. But to maintain the glory, the pattern, doing it God's way. Okay, two more points. A church that's in unity, that's been flogged a fair bit, hasn't it? I wonder why God keeps having to say it. So the prayer of John 17 is is always the gauge of the Spirit's desire for unity. John chapter 17, without reading the whole chapter, a tremendous chapter, that they may be one in the truth, that they may be one in the glory, that they may be one heart, they may be one mind. So the basis of our unity is we're one in the name of God. Verse 6, John 17, I have manifested thy name unto the men which you gave me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they've kept the word. Unity in the word. Sorry, unity in the name of God. Secondly, unity in the word of God. You read through that same, same verse, I've given them the word, and they're holding on to that word. Verse 8, I've given them the words which you gave me. They've received them. And they've known surely that I've come from you and they've believed that thou had sensed me. So here we have unity in the name of God who is Christ. Unity in the word of the living God. One in truth. 
Unity in the glory. Unity in the glory. Verse 10. All mine are thine, thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. One in the glory. Verse 22 is the same. The glory which you gave me, I gave them, that they may be one. So unity primarily is that we are united on the basis of the glory of God, the word of God, the name of God. And verse 23, 4 and 26, the love of God. 24, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. They may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou loves me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them. Fourfold basis of church unity. And unity is not just within the church. Of course, that's vital. One heart, one mind. Because if it's not unity, it'll be sectarianism, which is one person with a different doctrine, one person emphasising peripheral issues, one person with a badge around the neck saying, I want to be a leader and I'm going to appoint myself, I'll find some people and we'll all meet. It happens in every single church. Drives me crazy. No, well, I'm not going crazy. Drives me sane. <laughs> what is this about? In a sheepfold, wolfish behaviour. How does that work? Watchmen, prayer warriors, all of us. How does that work? How does a wolf get in? Well, number one, they're dressed the same as us. They're dressed the same, look the same, sound the same. They can charismatic clap, charismatic dance. They can do the outward form of religion, but the heart's far from God. How do you how do you know a wolf? I'm not trying to be negative. Please keep loving me now. I don't want you to think mm, growling at us. When I was a school teacher. The kids used to call me Growly Howley. <laughs> Some of the kids. You know which kids used to call me that? The naughty ones. <laughs> oh dear, sorry walking through the Hay Street Mall witnessing many years ago, this great, huge, six foot two, three policeman came up to me and said, hello, Growly Harley. (laughs) I used to teach him in Capel. I said, I've changed, I've changed, I've changed, I've changed. Don't arrest me. So we have unity based on what God says, the name, the word, the glory and the love. But unity, as I said, not just within the congregation. How about unity with the Baptist church on the corner there? How about unity with the Macedonian church with those who truly believe? I understand we're not yoked with unbelieving believers or religious demons. We're not yoked with that. But there there will be true faith in hearts in every congregation. So we maintain a level of unity saying, you know what, if they're for us, I'm for them. Not against them, I'm for them. You see, you have a unity of the spirit before you have a unity of the faith. The unity of the faith comes with more revelation of scripture and then we all start to think alike. And our opinions of sectarianism just bow their knees and get off. It's not how I think anymore. When I was a child, I used to think like a child because I was hurt, I was bruised, had some bad attitudes. Now that I'm a man, I'm thinking like a man. I've grown up according to the word of God. Uh, Fourthly, the church has to be a glorious church. Ephesians 5, 32. A glorious church. We've heard that many times, but we're still aiming for it in our experience. Church full of the glory. Ephesians 5, verse 23. Sorry. And that's again, Robin, in the husband and the wife. The husband's the head of the wife. Christ's the head of the church. He's the saviour of the body. So that's the basis of what he's saying there. Um, he, he will sanctify the church, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, verse 26, that he might present to himself a, say it with me, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. So a glorified church, cleansed by the, the word, John 15, you're clean by the word. Hallelujah. Sanctified by the word, by the spirit, clothed with glory, Christ in us, Christ on us, Christ around us, church without spot or wrinkle or blemish, even as the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't offer an animal that had a blemish, 
They tried to find one which was perfect. So that, that's a picture of the sacrifice we bring to the Lord. A holy church, separated from sin. Remember the two emphases of sin in the New Testament, doctrinal matters, behavioural issues. And finally, the fact that unity and glory is affected whether there be the proper pattern, not just a gathering but an assembling. The Lord says, this fits, you fit, this fits, he fits, she fits, this gift, that gift, that anointing, and it just flows under the Spirit of God. That's the assembly. The gathering, a whole pile of bricks just thrown all over the place, scattered, disorder, dishonour, and uh, factions. I belong to Apollos. I belong to this one, that one, this one, that one. Denominationalism. You know, it's a funny thing, but I've thought about this for years. Do you know that non-denominational churches can be more denominational than any other group and more sectarian? You know, we, are, we are pride ourselves, we are non-denominational, but the attitude is we are so exclusive, we formed ourselves another denomination. That's just something I've thought about over the years. And I laugh. God doesn't laugh, I laugh. So the sin of sectarianism, let me finish with that. Uh, one of the greatest indictments against the body of Christ is the divisions, yeah? yeah. The divisions are evidence of carnality in all its forms. Yeah. Uh, sectarianism or the forming of a sect is the work of the flesh but often it has the influence of spirits, evil spirits. And uh, Paul spoke of these divisions and he uses the words um, strife. The Greek word means translated uh, contention, strife, division. He uses the word variance and that is those who love to debate every issue. Always got an opinion on everything and just ram it down you. Strife, contention, division. Sedition, divisions. Heresies, sectarianism or forming your own group with your own opinion. And those opinions will be heresies if it's not the word of God. And another description of the sectarianism is the party spirit where people are divided according to some of these wrong opinions and the gathering of others that you indoctrinate so they end up thinking like you think, regardless of what's been revealed. Now, I find that shocking, that as Christians we would believe stuff that's not from Scripture. Why would we? It seems crazy. So, I believe that you and I are desiring the fullness of the glory. However, there has to be a pattern which is the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ, the word of God, Jesus, the living word, the scriptures, the written word. Secondly, it needs to be a church that knows how to get victory after victory, it's certainly aiming for victory after victory and remains militant. As a demonstration to the world, this kingdom is greater. Sickness, bow your knee. Debt, I cancel you. Debt, speaking the language of heaven and seeing it come to pass. Thirdly, uh, desiring unity, desiring glory. And one of the greatest ways to have unity in that area of unity and glory is get rid of the sectarianism, that spirit that divides even us. It could be minor things. I've seen churches split right down the middle. Absolutely, I've seen three or four church, major church splits and I think of it, what a, what a wicked thing. However, endeavour to maintain the unity of the spirit, it won't happen. Yeah, and bind it, bind the spirit behind it. That's the authority we have. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Food for thought, Lord. Food for thought. Not just thought, food to believe. Food to act on. We thank you, Lord. We've heard, therefore, without excuse, we're going to do, according to the grace you put upon our lives, we're going to do what you ask us to do because we want more of the glory. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. More of the glory, more of the power. More miracles, more signs and more wonders. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Friday night a young man testified that he came to the well the week before and he'd had a major problem with the, tell me what that is again, the rotor. Rotor Had it for six years, constant pain. And he showed me that he, he said, I could move, move my arm that far like that. But he came into an atmosphere of the glory, a level of the glory, and word of knowledge just sort of pinned the need, so he w- responded to the need. And he just ca- came walking down the aisle a little bit, and those who were there were witness to it, and he went, Shh. 
with an arm that he couldn't move for six years except a little bit that way. He went straight up like that. And I thought, Lord, that's what this world is waiting for, that level of glory where even the dead are raised, where even the dead are raised. Hallelujah. We're getting there. We're desiring it. We're getting angry with, with less results than what we should have. Amen. Keep hanging in. Keep following the pattern. Keep understanding that we are to be assembled together, not just gathering as loose stones. See, loose stones don't commit. Loose stones actually don't even connect. They don't even connect. And yet we're a body. Amen.